to wrestling, I mean, to NUS Press, obviously, and putting on such a great show, and great arrangement, and for doing such a great job of putting the book together. It was a really difficult job. Um, that's one reason it took so long to get it out, is that it's got kind of almost 500 pages and approximately 400 illustrations. To get them all to fit together was an extremely difficult task, and I hope that you will be as happy and satisfied as I am with the result. With one exception, I wish there were more color in it. Uh, if you all buy lots of copies, maybe that will convince NUS Press to put on a color edition in the future. So this is the first report I did in 1985. So the first one only took me less than one year to get out. Uh, so there was a, quite a timeline between this one, which sold all the only there were a thousand copies, I believe, and they wanted them unavailable. And um, so then this is a, kind of one of the first drafts of the cover that we had. And uh, this is, of course, what we came up with in the end. So uh, the, the whole idea was, in the end, to put together it kept getting longer and longer, a whole summary of the research that had been done in Singapore eventually just had to be stopped at some point. And it obviously has to be put together and revised again in real be more discoveries. There'll be a lot more um, things to write about in the future. Singapore's archaeology is no by no means finished. It's just a, hopefully a very early stage of its development. Now, my first research is on Eskimos. Here's where I started out in 1967 in northern Canada. Um, working on uh, the sea coast of Hudson's Bay, and one year later, I found myself here in Malaysia, at the foot of Kedah Peak, and I uh, was in the Peace Corps at the time. I was working on agricultural cooperative formation, but um, lo and behold, there were all these ruins of ancient temples in the same area, the Bujang Valley, and immediately I got hooked. Here was a whole area that nobody knew anything about. It was a center point, a point of great civilizations coming together. Um, so many of the various kinds of questions immediately came to mind, and here I was out in the field threshing rice. <laughs> so that, that led me to think about China changing my field, and so I went into um, um, a PhD program in archaeology at Cornell University. I did get to do a little bit of comparative research in the tropical area of America, working on the, the Honduras, the St. Paul, San Pedro Sula area. Here we are crawling through fences, going um, over barbed wire and uh, along cattle herds and so on. So working a little bit on the American tropics as well, but that was just a way of getting myself back to Southeast Asia. So 1976, 77, I got my first research permit to work in Indonesia, so we were surveying. Um, and here's me down in the pit with Professor Kwa and Mrs. Kwa. Uh, they came and visited me at that particular site, so we, they've been able to see me in action. Um, quite a long time before I actually got to work here in Singapore. So, um, and then it was the same time that my son, my first son was born, was here with us tonight. As our music is here. So he was born, um, as he was, he was one of the results of this expedition, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when he was in. Uh, and so then, after that, in my next position, I got offered two jobs and I finished my PhD. One was going to teach at the University of Montana, and the other was going back to Sumatra and working for USAID, and there was no contest. I went back to Sumatra, back to uh, setting up farmers cooperatives again, but once again I got to find, by, uh, almost by design, but it was really by chance, another archaeological site. One of my projects was setting up a fisheries cooperative, marketing place, and it turned out to be, have been built on the site of the old British fort in Mancoolin, which was set up in 1685, which was the forerunner, of course, of Singapore. And so that's the, the profile sticking out of the bank of soil here, and so I got to do some archaeological research on early British in Sumatra at that time. After that, I got offered a job with the Ford Foundation to go and uh, set up an archaeological curriculum at Gajamanda University. So for six years, I lived in the shadow of Wodudur. I worked on the Wodudur itself, and I've written a couple of books on that. And I was at the Fakultasu in Budaya, uh, for Gajmala University for six years, and while I was there, after three years there, of course, the Chongwa started thinking about the possibility of doing something in Singapore. And so we walked around uh, Fort Canning, thinking of a possible site to excavate. 
And uh, it was two months I did this set up on the site of Kramat and Kandar Shah. He knew that it hadn't been disturbed, there had been a Kramat there right through the British period, the Fort Canton period, and then the Independence period. And so he got some of the people at the National Museum and to raise money and borrow that shell. And I have to thank Long Kim Fu also, who was the, um, the kind of public relations director for Shell Petroleum in those days. And so that's uh, Connie Shears. She was one of the curators. This is the same time as Mrs. Ang Lee Seok Chi, was a curator of the, uh, the Straits Chinese Gallery, which is right where I'm standing now. I think this is the same room where Ang Lee Seok Chi's uh, gallery was. And uh, Tong Wan also managed to get me some so called volunteers, <laughs> national service men. But they weren't really volunteers, <laughs> they were under a punishment detail. <laughs> they had to go on and so their job was to help dig. <coughs> and um, so there's Connie and the Louisiana's and, and um, here they are digging away, and they actually got to like it. Actually, that's probably the most interesting thing they've ever done in their lives. And so now there's one of them that still haunts Fort Cannon. This guy on the right, if you go up to Fort Cannon, almost any day you stay there an hour, you see him walking around. He was one of my diggers back in 1984. And he still likes to go around and hang out there. So we say hi every time we see him. I took this picture just about a month ago. So he still has five members in the first excavation, 29 years ago. So then it was, uh, it came to pass that uh, Tom Brown put me in touch with Ernest Chu, who was the uh, head of the history department at the time, thinking ahead that because in 1987, Singapore was scheduled to host the ASEAN archaeological excavation. And so in 1987, they got me a job here in Singapore. Uh, I was in the history department, and one of my assignments was to work on the, uh, the excavation we did this for Canning. And one of the people who was interested in it was uh, none other than Peter Schulpert's wife, Lee Chow Lin, who was squatting there next to the pit, who later on became the head of this august institution. And she was the head of it at the time when it was proposed that the National Museum actually be sponsored the book. All these things fit together in very strange ways. So Torlin excavated, or excavated along with Peter in those days. Uh, this is the 88th of the Lee Foundation. The Friends of the Museum became very heavily involved in this excavation. So we did with one big long trench right up the side of Fort Canyon, demonstrating that what we found in 1984, 87 were not just flukes, but there was a very large archaeological site on Fort Canyon. And so this is the whole chronology of Singapore excavations. You'll have to read about this in the book, I'm not going to go through them all. But you can see that we've been pretty busy over the last three years. And all of the work has been done by volunteers. Everyone, uh, all of the work has actually been done by people who did it because they wanted to do it. Not uh, because they had to, because they were paid. There's never been a shortage of people to work on archaeological sites. Volunteers in Singapore, public spirits, it's very strong here. I never had a difficulty getting more people than I can even accommodate. These include students from high schools, junior colleges, Raffles Institution, and so on. You see the t-shirt there, maybe on the lower right. Lots and lots of students have come. Um, lots of individuals from Sankin Tay. And that's him on the right in this picture. Uh, his wife, uh, Siao Junhua, the famous ceramic sculptor, Ming Tang, who did several sculptures called Archaeological Study 1 and 2 and 3, which are now in the NUS and the Tang Gallery. Um, over the years, many, many students, and um, uh, there's uh, Shah Alam on the right, on the right, who later on became a curator here in the museum. Now, Lady Janet McDonald, sorry, that's uh, her there. At that time, uh, she, well, I had worked with her before in, in, in Bunkungu, because her husband was a British ambassador to Jakarta. His next posting was Beijing. He was the, the British ambassador to Beijing in 1989. She would sneak down to Singapore when she could get away and actually be on Fort Canyon. So that's her at the right, her shop. Um, that's my daughter. <laughs> so her dead, dead down in the picture. And that's Ezra and uh, Vanya, then excavating. So I dragged them around the site. Neither of them has become archaeologists. They both were a lot smarter than me, and they went into biological engineering. But that's was that here actually because his company has a manufacturing facility here. And um, between the two of them, they now have three girls. We hope that one of them will become the next generation of the mixing of family. Um, 
Very similar students, that's Lin Chen Sun there, along with Mark May Fong, who's now doing her PhD at the University of Washington. Roland Stuhlmeier did his PhD, but that's Go Biao Kim at the lower right, and the Cowan, who went off to the University of Washington also after that. And uh, here, among the others, that's Go Biao Kim again, who's now, of course, a PhD lecturer at the Nanan Technological University. Susan Go, who works for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Dr. Ko Kang Lee, who is now uh, also a lecturer at the University of Seoul. Dr. Irvin Chan Johnson, these are all students, all of whom. Um, none of them except Dr. Go became an archaeologist. Uh, the other ones have all gone on to very illustrious careers in different future. At least, didn't hurt that. I've had a um, Slovenian archaeologist. This is Boyan Juric, whose wife was the Italian cultural attaché. Worked on the site also. Some of the very nice carving on the side of the, the pit that's preserved there is his scraping. Uh, Tom Tang Tang. Uh, so who was one of his, she was my last foreign law sister on the National Parks Board, has now gone off in a very successful career of her own in the museum and exhibit design, and she's here tonight also. In 2001, the Parks Board uh, did set up a very nice archaeological display on the site, and that's the best one of its type, at least in Southeast Asia. I cannot talk about the rest of the world, but at least as a preserved archaeological pit in an urban area in Southeast Asia, there's nothing to compare it with this. The Parks Board did a really nice job on it. It's been preserved very well over the last uh, 12 years. It was set up in 2001. Um, and we kept on digging. These are more students from the left here. Um, Lim Shetian, who is now uh, uh, got his master's degree in history. Uh, Sim Wang Chan, who's still wearing her PhD. And then you ask now, she's from China. Uh, she comes from Beijing University. She's doing a comparison of the Singapore finds with contemporary sites in Fujian and Java. Fu Shu Teng got a master's degree. Now works uh, with us in uh, China and me at the Institute at the Archaeology Unit. Um, my family got me, Dr. Go, and uh, Sharon uh, Lin Wonghui. So Sharon Wonghui now a lecture at the uh, um, uh, City University of Hong Kong. Um, Parliament House. Now, this, is a, this is just one of the many kind of hazards of the profession, having to evacuate the site when a big downpour comes along. Um, Ross Blossom Park, more people who have been instrumental over the years in various activities, the archaeological community, Lucy Chong, Lin Chin Hui. Uh, then he was first a volunteer before he moved into the museum full time. Very important uh, assistant in lots of our archaeological research projects. That's just in front of the museum where the SMU is now. On the Khan Cheryl and Lo, who's a long time curator here before retiring to raise a family. Omar Chen, Omar is here also, I'm very happy to stay tonight. And that's Cheryl again, and she actually worked with me for several years on trying to get this book ripped into shape. She did a lot of work on the text before it was turned over to the uh, US press. So a lot of the book was originally shaped by her as well. Another person, especially I want to give uh, um, a credit to is Lee Sion Lai, who was for many years as president of the Theraphic Society, and um, who again organized a lot of the volunteer activities on Fort Kenyon and elsewhere. That's her on the right on one of our trips with the Theraphic Society to Myanmar, along with the late, great Ivan Bloom. Uh, Duxton Hill, we have done in the colonial period as well. Uh, the back streets of Tanjung Pagar, and these are three or more of the people, Shahala. Lucille Yap, Rajmont Kaur, these were all paid assistants of mine for several years at the Fort Kenyon Archaeological Project. And of course, place, Asian civilizations, again, many, many friends of the museum worked at that site for several months down in the pit there between the museum and the river. Singapore Cricket Club and the Padang. Uh, here we have uh, Karen Chin, who is now, of course, an education officer in the Asian Civilizations Museum. Old Parliament House, again, here's Chen Hui, and uh, he, we were only allowed to dig in there for a short period of time, but Chen Hui then managed to organize the workers there who were actually excavating the floor under the old um, Parliament House to collect a lot of artifacts. And so we actually managed to do this kind of um, real archaeology, I call it, kind of sneaking around and picking up things under the old Parliament building, even though we were only allowed to work there for a limited period of time. And so Chen Wei gets a lot of credit for having 
prayed a lot of time for that. St. Andrew's Cathedral, we're very grateful for the cathedral for giving us almost a year to excavate there before they put up their new ground uh, uh, auditorium. Many, many, because we had such a long time, we got to invite many schools to take part in. Often we don't get the kind of permission until the very last minute. And so we don't have time to organize big uh, volunteer groups. But for the St. Andrew's Cathedral, we got lots and lots of schools. And the more longer it, we got to go out, the more schools signed up. If we could have a really long term archaeological excavation again sometime, um, we could probably get thousands of school children to get involved in it. Pistana Compong Guam, uh, this is uh, Bill Clinton didn't really show up, but I'm sure that he was on top of the world joining us. And we didn't really find Bill either. <laughs> but um, Omar Chen spent a long time excavating there in the courtyard before the Santa Familia Heritage Center. And uh, lots of other individuals also. Again, Chinese high students here, for example, that came and spent a fair amount of time at that site. This world of Tomasi, with help from Infocom Authority in Singapore and National Heritage Board. So you can now go back in time and experience what we think the world of Tomasi looked like online. And uh, I'd also like to thank all the newspaper reporters who uh, covered our stories over the years. We've never had trouble getting coverage in the press and in the, also the broadcast media. And the Chinese and the lay press have given us a lot of support and attention as well. We're very grateful to the press public that we've got to try and keep on we're keeping the public abreast of all the discoveries we've been making over the years. And I've had another volunteer who's actually published two books on Singapore archaeology, colonial period. This is Jennifer Berry. She did one very good book on Pulau Saigon. Using a cell phone keeper and the tour didn't help pick up. Again, we had to sneak in on weekends because we were given the official permission to do any work there. And she did a very good job also on the Estana Campo Blanc materials. These are both privately published. Again, it gives you an idea of how archaeology has this power to inspire a great number of people into extraordinary feats. These are both in the National <laughs> Library, for example. And beyond Singapore, Singaporeans have also gone with support from various organizations, particularly the foundation to other excavations that I've done over the years. Like Dr. Go got her first field work in East Java. She came along in this uh, field school of archaeology in East Java, Trulua, which was Singapore's overlord at this time, between 1991 and 93. That's me and Shah going around again. And then we got some more money from the Lee Foundation in the survey of North Bintan, when the Bintan Beach in the National Resort was being set up, and the area of the Pulau Tuju area. So this is the group that went on that survey. So Singapore, this was Singapore's hinterland, basically, in the 14th century. It was not just a single island. It's a hinterland, and it's collecting area extended far out into what is now the Rio Inga Archipelago. Uh, Orchard Marine, again, I'd like to thank uh, Monsieur Paul Munoz, who has published on a book on Indonesian archaeology. He also provided the money for this that survey we did in uh, Jambi, Sumatra, back in 2005. That's, that's Omar Chen and Lin Chen Sen excavating the bank there, of uh, the Batanghai River. Finally, in 2011, we got the archaeological unit launched. So many, many things, of course, have to go also to the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies. And that's the um, ambassador for Salapani, who was ahead at the time, and uh, Luang Gangwu, Han uh, Sen and the president of Sarvala, of course, very graciously launched our archaeological unit. And so now we do have a kind of a permanent location here where uh, Shu and Chen uh, work full time, although uh, Chen part time like me, Shu full time, and then of course, uh, Professor Kwa, Yao Kim, and I all work there part time. And uh, so thanks to the National Parks Board staff again for all the work that they allowed us to do and that they themselves participated in. All the, the volunteers, and this is Patricia, um, no, that's not Patricia, no, tell, uh, Matthew, I have to thank Matthew Ross, of course, and Patricia, his wife, and all the Japanese volunteers, many, many volunteers from various nationalities, including the Japanese volunteer group. I've been literally washing hundreds of thousands of putters over the last 25 years, digging them up. But it's a lot easier to get people to dig. I never had any trouble getting people to excavate. For some reason, it's a lot more physically exerting, but they love to be the discoverer or something. To wash it 
and to label it, to catalog it, that's the hard job. This is the harder that the last couple of years in the US has finally given us a laboratory. And this is our fantastic laboratory. So we're not quite sure how we're going to integrate this, as Professor Kwa said. It would be a good thing to integrate this material into a regular teaching program. Um, but still, most of the stuff is not even cataloged yet. And the room is just barely room enough to store everything we got. Not really enough space to do teaching. We just have little groups of eight or ten students in there at one time. We do have foreign scholars who come here who want to work on our materials from everywhere from Australia to China um, to America. And I do take some students out there. Dr. Go takes some of her students there as well. We really need more space than we need a proper teaching facility. This is basically a lab and a, a store. Um, and there are, there's other you know, buildings on Cambridge if we could just get our hand, well, hands on them. That could be the store, this could be turned into the building. We just need a tiny little bit more money. This is a commercial here. And this is, if you want to look at this is our view. It is the greatest view in the whole campus. So we can sit up on our the laboratory balcony, and if you want to endow it, you can even be named after you. And then you can have this view. And your name is right or after. So I hope it gives us uh, give an idea of how this particular book is not my book. It belongs to many, many people who are here tonight, some who could not be here. But this is a really good example of what happens when a lot of people get together with a very strong commitment to some field. So I hope I've given you enough credit in the book. I couldn't name everyone, but I've named as many people in, in this room, many, many people in this room I have named in the introduction. I apologize for those who I didn't put in. But thank you all so much for helping me to achieve what we have done and what we've got uh, in, in the displays here in this museum, a little bit of the Fort Canning place, a little bit of the Asian Civilization Museum, a little bit of the Santosa Maritime Museum, a little bit of St. Anne's Cathedral. We, are, we do have displays in a lot of little areas now. And so again, it's all tribute to this kind of group spirit that has continued to find its expression in our technology. Thank you very much. I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation from John. Uh, I would like now to invite Mr. Pachamban, our guest of honor, Mr. Peter Schoffel, uh, John, and Mr. Scanner Miden of the National Museum to come on stage for the symbolic action of launching the book, or rather excavating the book. <laughs> As you can see, they have the brushes here, not for brushing their hair. <laughs>